Hi everyone, welcome to Modules in JDK 9. My name is Alex Buckley and I write the specification of the Java language and the Java Virtual Machine. I've worked on the Java platform since 2006, so I've seen the full life cycles of JDK 7, 8 and 9. I worked on Project Coin and Invoke Dynamic in JDK 7, on lambdas and type annotations in JDK 8, and on the modules in JDK 9 that we'll be talking about today. First, we'll talk about what modules are and how they improve the developer experience. Second, we'll talk about how the JDK has been turned into modules. And third, we'll talk about some of the things you need to know about migrating to JDK 9. One of the core features of any programming language is the ability to reuse code so that large programs can be built from small programs. In Java, the basic unit of reuse is traditionally the class. Java has wonderful mechanisms for promoting reuse of a class, such as inheritance for reusing behavior and interfaces for reusing abstractions. However, when your Java program gets to be 5, 10, 20 packages, in two, four, eight jar files, it becomes difficult to visualize how all those classes and interfaces interact, which means it's hard to control who is reusing what. Just imagine how difficult it is to control reuse within a really large code base, like the 217 official packages shown here from JDK 8. The only way to share code between packages is with the public modifier, but then the code is shared with everyone. A package is a great way to organize classes, but most people wish there was a way to organize packages too. Modules let you do that. A module is a set of packages designed for reuse. This is a long overdue building block in the Java language. In effect, modules record the structure of your program so that the parts you want to be reused can be reused, while the parts you don't want to be reused can't be reused. A program built of modules will be more reliable than a program built from a loose set of packages in jar files that can access each other freely and that expose too many APIs to the outside world. Here's a module that everyone will soon be familiar with, JavaBase. It's the foundation of every Java program, like JavaLang object is the root of every class. In blue are the packages of JavaBase intended for use by code outside the module. These are its exported packages. In red are the packages internal to JavaBase. They can be used by code inside the module, but not by code outside the module. These are its concealed packages. A module is declared in a new kind of file called modulinfo.java. It gives the name of the module and its exported packages. By exporting the javalang package, it means that the public classes of javalang are accessible from outside Java base. A package that is not explicitly exported, such as com-sun crypto provider, is concealed. Its public classes are not accessible outside Java base. This is the first feature of modules in JDK 9, strong encapsulation. A module isn't just a set of packages, it's a set of exported packages and concealed packages. This means that access control is more powerful in JDK 9 than in JDK 8. In JDK 9, you can arrange for public classes to be accessible to everyone, or accessible only to other classes in the same module, or accessible to classes in the same module and a limited set of friend modules. So if you're looking at public on a class declaration, it no longer means that everyone can access the class. Access depends on whether the class's module exports the class's package. When you write your own module, you specify the modules it depends on. This is the second feature of modules in JDK 9, reliable dependencies. 
A module isn't just a set of packages. It's a set of packages that reuse the packages exported by other modules. Here, we have a Hello World module that exports a package of its own and depends on Java base with the requires keyword. This means that code in the Hello World module can import any of the packages exported by Java base. But there is no way for code in the Hello World module to import any of the packages concealed by Java base. There are quite a few benefits to putting code in modules. For a start, the Hello World module can be run with a simple Java command that points to a directory of modules, the minus P, and the module to be run, the minus M. You don't need to set the class path. The modules themselves say what they depend on. JDK9 checks the dependencies both when you compile and when you run. It checks that every module that is required is available. That's a big improvement over the class path where you don't discover missing jars until later. It checks that modules don't require each other in a cycle. Cycles lead to code that is hard to understand and maintain. Finally, it checks that a package is exported from exactly one other module. This means there are no split packages. Split packages are the mess you get on the class path when two jars contain the same package and you load some classes from one jar and other classes from the other jar. Avoiding split packages is also a win for performance because JDK9 knows exactly where each package lives, which is much better than repeatedly scanning every jar on the class path looking for a needed class. By the way, modules are not mandatory. You can keep putting jars on the class path, and JDK9 supports a gradual migration to modules so that you can choose the trade-off of how much work you're willing to do to modularize versus the benefits of modules. Let's turn our attention to the JDK. 20 years ago, the Java platform was small, just a few hundred classes, and the organization of the JDK wasn't a problem. But every year, the platform grew bigger, and now it's tens of thousands of classes. The JDK is huge, and worse, it's monolithic. In reality, the Java platform is not one thing. It's more like 25 separate frameworks, including the Swing UI framework, a crypto framework, a scripting framework, multiple XML processing frameworks, and so on. There's no reason these separate frameworks have to be tightly coupled in one download. In fact, it's an impediment in developing the JDK. The overly tight coupling raises development and testing costs, which turns into slower platform evolution. Plus, the larger the surface of your platform, the more difficult it is to secure. And it's an impediment to a lot of users, both those who want to run their applications on smaller devices and those who want to run more instances of their, of their application on large systems. Even if you only wanted a part of the JDK, you had to take all of it. That all changes in JDK 9. We've taken the monolithic JDK and broken it up into a few dozen modules. Some of these are part of the Java SE specification. Some are just part of the JDK implementation. Here's a graph of the Java SE modules. At the bottom, there's Java base, which everything depends on and which depends on nothing itself. We've broken out the various frameworks into their own modules instrumentation, logging, XML, scripting, desktop, which you can require or not require as your needs dictate. There's a Java SE module, which has no actual code in it, but just has dependencies. So you can say requires Java SE and be guaranteed to have all these modules available. It's worth mentioning that merely finding these module boundaries, which might be obvious in hindsight, was a tremendous engineering effort. You'll find in your own code that decoupling a monolith is much harder than building a loosely coupled system from the beginning. The good news going forward is that the discipline imposed by modules will prevent all of us from accidentally recreating a monolith. I'd like to quickly review the expectations of compatibility from JDK9. First up, there are various technologies from Java EE that ship in the JDK as well as in app servers. The list of Java EE modules in JDK9 includes Corba, JAXB, JAXWS, and common annotations. 
These modules are deprecated in JDK 9 and will be removed in a future release. Because of this, they are disabled by default in JDK 9. If you're running code on the class path, you may need to use the add modules command line flag to enable the Java EE modules. Second, a lot of tools and libraries try to access parts of the JDK that are meant for internal use only. Unfortunately, it'll take a while for tool and library developers to move away from this practice. So JDK 9 temporarily allows access to JDK internals, but prints a warning when it happens. There's a command line flag to avoid these warnings, so please check with tool and library developers about how to deploy on JDK 9. Finally, there are miscellaneous changes in JDK 9 that are unrelated to modules, but might affect code that ran on JDK 8. Notably, code that assumes the Java version string begins with one dot, or assumes that the JDK lives in a file called rt.jar, will fail on JDK 9. Again, please check with tool and library developers about which versions are needed to run on JDK 9. To conclude, JDK 9 is important because it enables modular development all the way down. The Java language and the Java virtual machine understand modules very deeply so that the applications you write and the libraries you consume and even the JDK itself can all be developed and tested and packaged and deployed as modules with clear APIs and well-protected internals. Making everyone play by the same modular rules has great benefits for reliability, maintainability and security, though it may take some time for popular tools and libraries to catch up. You can download JDK 9 now and follow what's happening with JDK development at OpenJDK. Also follow us on Twitter at OpenJDK and hashtag Java 9. And with that, thank you very much.